if everybody's ready, um, so the um, purpose of this panel is really to reflect on some of the issues that, uh, that Valerie Amos raised in her speech, but also to broaden it out to draw on the expertise of our panel um, this afternoon. So if I introduce them briefly um, from my right, um, we have Greg, pa Greg Power, who is the um, founding director of Global Partners Government, uh, Governance that does parliamentary strengthening work in uh, countries across the world, particularly in fragile states. Um, he previously worked uh, as a special advisor to the uh, successive leaders of the House of Commons. Um, and I should say, in the interest of transparency, um, some years ago, he was also head of research at the Hansard Society. So we have a, a long association with, with Greg and, and Global Partners. Um, to my, my right, immediate right, Professor Niraja Gopal Jayal um, from um, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Um, she's a professor in the Center for Study of Law and Governance, and she's written many, uh, many books, many articles and papers, most recently her award-winning book on citizenship and its discontents and Indian history. And then immediately to my left, Janet Boston, who brings a very different perspective to our discussion this afternoon, which is important in the context of our project going forward with its focus on how we can involve artists, um, people working in the cultural arena, in the arts and humanities, um, to work alongside researchers to put a different take on, on democracy um, and how both how we research democracy, but also how we disseminate the research findings that our, that our national scholars will, will be generating so that it can influence the policy debate and the policy discussion. Janet is uh, founding director of Perspective Film Production. She's the producer of the award-winning um, Hands-On Global Solutions Programme for BBC World. And, uh, and I know her um, particularly because for a period of time she was CEO of the John Smith Trust, um, which many of you be here from the UK will be aware, John Smith, the former Labour leader, um, and a, a trust was set up to support leadership and development in, uh, in Russia and the former Eastern European uh, states um, under, his, under his name. So, uh, so Janet brings both a perspective on democracy but art, also arts and culture. So I'm going to ask them to speak for a few minutes each um, on the themes that they want to pick up and then we'll throw it open to a discussion on the Q&A. Um, and get your thoughts and, and, and questions uh, as part of that, uh, as part of the de taking the debate forward. So, Naraja, do you want to kick off? Sure. Um, yeah. Certainly. Thank you, thank you, Ruth. Um, so, um, I'm afraid I'm going to rehearse some of the ground we've already covered in the last uh, hour or so. Um, but uh, let me uh, do it anyway, and hopefully we can take the discussion forward beyond where we've already been. Um, till only a couple of years ago, the energies of Democrats were focused on st the strengthening or deepening of democracy in the global south. And now, suddenly, a series of events, eloquently described just a few minutes ago by Baroness Amos, have, as she said rightly, turned the world upside down and brought into question many of our settled assumptions, even complacent assumptions, about the triumphs of the gloriously pedigreed democracies of the global north, this one more than others. So rather like Tolstoy's unhappy families, all democratic societies today seem to be unhappy in their own way. What appears to be the dark side of democracy is arguably just the fulfillment of democracy's logic the democratizing of democracy, as it were. In the North, we have protests, and someone alluded to that a minute ago, against the capture of democracy by elites, its deep links with capital, the hollow promise of political equality in the face of growing economic and social inequality. So the new democratic project in the global North is about renewing the democratic ideal. In the younger democracies of the South, of various degrees of fragility, the challenges range from unstable transitions to democracy, and we've heard a little bit about some of those this morning, to lapses into authoritarianism, from the curse of poverty and ethnic conflict to the curse of natural resources like oil. 
and the range of interventions in the South, whether these are to implant democratic institutions where they did not previously exist, or to breathe life into existing but empty shells of democracy, ironically, this entire range of interventions is aimed at strengthening precisely the institutions that have triggered disaffection and cynicism in the North. At the heart of both these projects um, is a worry, I think, about the representativeness of representative democracy. Across the world, the reaction to the breakdown of representative democracy and its legitimacy deficit is finding expression in populism that claims to offer a purer, more genuine form of democracy. In the 1990s, it is interesting, the dissatisfaction with representative democracy found expression in more radical ideas like participatory democracy, right? Today, we have a different battle on our hands to reinstate the value of representative democracy itself. Now, parliaments we know are institutional expressions of this principle of representative democracy. And at this launch of the Global Research Network on Parliaments and People, I think it's also worth asking the question, we know what parliaments are, but who are the people? And representative democracy and populism offer very different answers to this question of who are the people. In a thin version of representative democracy, the classical sort of liberal uh, view, the political equality of citizens is guaranteed, but in a difference blind way. A thicker version of representative democracy recognizes diversity and strives to make elected legislatures reflective of this diversity so that the interests and preferences of minorities or women or other marginalized groups also find voice in law and policy. Populism, by contrast, appeals to an undifferentiated idea of the people whom it claims to represent in its homogenous entirety. The leader claims to be, as was just said uh, about uh, capitalists, the leader claims to be closer to the people and strives for a direct and unmediated relationship with the citizenry. Representative institutions, that is, mediating institutions like elected legislatures, are derided or even undermined. So populism is a sign of the breakdown of the connect between parliaments and people. Populism also reduces democracy to its foundational principle of raw numbers. Baroness Amos spoke a minute ago, about a few minutes ago, about democracy being reduced to elections. Populism reduces it even beyond that to the simple principle of majority rule. Democracy is about majority rule and not at all about the values typically associated with it, the values of equality, freedom, rights, and justice. Now, the dispute here is not only between representative democracy or populism or indeed any number of competing ideas of democracy. The question is, does anyone have a monopoly over the meaning of democracy? We know the perils of universalism. We accept that societies will be, as they say, differently democratic, as they mold democracy to local conditions. And some of these local experiments, like participatory budgeting or social audits, have been immensely empowering, extremely inventive, very enabling. Nevertheless, in today's circumstances, might it be worth thinking about, and this is just a question, might it be worth thinking about whether, in the midst of all these different, if you like, vernaculars of democracy, we should strive to find a common core that we can define as substantively democratic? This has at least two aspects, if not more. We acknowledge the institutional, but much less often the normative. At the institutional level, the democratic project is about all the things that we've been speaking about today, creating or restoring the connect between parliaments and people, holding representatives accountable, fostering civic engagement in civil society, um, and working towards greater inclusion through descriptive representation, but without losing sight of the more difficult goal of substantive representation. At the normative level, 
we need to perhaps recall the values associated with democracy. Valuing equality, a fundamental principle of democracy, would make us sensitive to the plight of minorities. Ideas of diversity would reaffirm our commitment to multiculturalism. The Kantian idea of hospitality to strangers would enable us to appreciate better our obligations to refugees. The idea of solidarity would sensitize us to the most morally abhorrent aspects of inequality, while fraternity would sensitize us to issues of climate change and intergenerational um, environmental justice. So democracy is always and everywhere a work in progress, but I think we are today in a moment that nudges us to think about whether the democratic idea has a common core. Are we going to be brave enough to try and attempt to um, have a stab at that core, at defining that core? One that no matter where it travels, still speaks to a recognizable and estimable idea of democracy in which people as citizens have agency. Thank you very much. Okay, so with a very different take on this debate, I'm going to ask Janet to, uh, for her, her thoughts. Well, thank you for inviting me to participate today. Um, when I was first asked, I wasn't at all sure that my experience as a film producer, director was at all relevant. Yet as I reflected, I realized that deepening democracy has been a theme which has run through most of my work and experience, as perhaps has the reconciliation between parliaments and people, although not so obviously. The first time I was struck by the power of film to directly influence public engagement was filming for Japanese TV news in Eastern Europe as the communist bloc collapsed. Interviewee after interviewee in country after country, when asked why now, declared it was the images from Chanaman Square which had moved them to act. The fixers we were working with as we tried to put together the features on the first democratic elections were also shocked when asked if they could ask candidates to knock on people's doors in a certain way, just as a film producer always wants. We can't, they struggle to explain. Why? It's the knock that reminds us of the secret police, they explained. I tried to translate that into Japanese. <laughs> Years later, I was making a film, The Good Society, which had two versions, one for BBC World, the other for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting at the turn of the millennia. We filmed in six different countries, including from the yards in Jamaica, where young people were breaking down gang culture, to East London, where Telco was bringing different faith groups together, and then in Zimbabwe, in Matabililand, where a, liter a literacy project was using drama, poetry, and art to develop grassroots democracy. Many of those interviewed wanted to be shot in silhouette because they were still so traumatized by the, the, initial, the brutal massacres of the early 80s. But the young people openly sang and wrote of their hope for change using metaphors to describe corruption and their dislike of Mugabe. I thought of them last week as he was finally toppled and felt that perhaps more could have been done to show the full impact of his policies. Yet what the people I've, I filmed with wanted was to tell their stories their way to be heard. For them, what was important was knowing their voice would go out to a large international audience via the BBC, as well as at a conference, and then possibly on local TV too. It's too easy to forget that just because people are economically poor or vulnerable or living in a remote location, that they lack a sophisticated understanding of the power of an image and how they themselves might be portrayed. When I first worked with Professor Crewe, I was looking at how to challenge the way women, particularly in Africa, were depicted and persuaded Body Shop founder Anita Roddick to visit a range of enterprises from micro to macro where she could share her experience with women across the continent and celebrate their achievements. I still remember carrying out the research and hearing the women clap with relief when I explained that what we were trying to do was to celebrate their achievements. Interestingly, it was one of our development colleagues who wasn't so happy, a man, particularly with a focus on women. He asked, 
he asked, he challenged me so, so often. I said, well, where are the men in the rural country areas? And he then conceded he couldn't point me to them. The need to ensure women are represented is obviously just as great today. And in terms of deepening democracy, <coughs> vital. And it isn't just a battle to persuade the male village chief um, to stand aside for a woman. It's actually often the development worker who is the spokesman for the NGO refusing to stand aside for their younger female colleague who happens to be more articulate. The broader issue of representing people on the front line and how resilient they are with or without aid is one that continues to worry me. It's a wild leap, but perhaps it could explain why there is still a lack of public recognition of how many development projects or funding do actually work. For the Paris Climate Change Conference, I produce a series of films for UNDP's Equator Initiative 2015 prize, prize winners, all indigenous peoples fighting to save their environment, combat climate change, protect biodiversity, and campaign for their rights. Each community was battling incredible odds, in some cases facing death threats, yet their integrity came through within each film. And while the top images may have set the scene with drought, burning forests, or land grabbing, the overriding sense from each winner is of how communities have turned around desperate situations to those which are empowering and transferable. The reception in Paris was extraordinary, with the best accolade from the communities themselves. As they said, the films were the highlight of their two weeks. I tried to find out why, and they said it was because they could finally share their experiences, both with each other and with a wider political audience. So why film? Despite the fact that I've always worked on ridiculously low budgets, it is expensive when compared with the cost of a life-saving development project. But it does have the potential to reach huge numbers of people, and if designed carefully, it can target multiple audiences. For example, following one broadcast being repurposed for educational use. In fact, I recently discovered a series I made over a decade ago called Living with Disaster was still being used with students at UCL over a decade after it was made. Film can even prompt development innovation and transfer and can perhaps be relevant in this way to deepening democracy. Um, as I discovered with a series I created and produced for several years which shared global solutions by combining film, online and backup support to share ideas about what can be done for a more sustainable world wherever you are. It prompted the biggest audience reaction on BBC World and I'm currently looking at reviving the idea as the Paris Climate Change Conference revealed the need to keep telling stories about what works. More importantly, perhaps, with film is the need to build empathy across continents, to understand, for example, with an issue like climate change, that those most affected least deserve to see their coastlines eroded, fish stocks decimated, forests devastated, and, age and species threatened. And that these people and communities are not waiting for aid, yet are actively finding ways to tackle the problems which have accelerated at a pace they could never have imagined. That they need recognition, which gives them not just the chance to speak with their parliaments, but within an international context that challenges exploitation, particularly of the natural resources from which they depend for their very survival. Perhaps, too, that deepening democracy might involve creating respect for their indigenous rights and different legal structures, as well as exposing the exploitation by companies and governments who have managed to go under the radar, partly as film used to be so expensive. And coming to Baroness uh, Amos's point about accountability, working with local people to record and film their experiences is a brilliant tool on lots of levels. The Rioni, who featured in the Paris films, are now armed with an array of modern digital weapons to guard their land and protect their livelihoods. These video warriors have reduced land clearances of the Amazon by 80%. Other communities in PNG and the Guyana are using mobile apps to check land encroachment. And in Guyana, they're actually creating their own maps using drones. So should everyone brush into making films? It's worth noting that there is a big difference between using film to record and document process and making a film with a strong narrative and a few strong characters who can tell their story in a compelling way. Often the hardest part of making a film is knowing what to leave out, be it a picture or a piece of sync. And it's where there are usually the most arguments if you're working with an agency or an NGO, as the filmmaker, as the filmmaker will generally know what will appeal to the audience 
rather than to the minister. And generally, what is interesting is that the minister is pretty much like the general audience. NGOs who think they can only get filmmakers in at the end of a project just to disseminate some results are missing lots of opportunities. Really exciting films get made when filmmakers are involved in inquiring about difficult issues and are involved in the research, not just as an afterthought. Even more complex is to not only make films, but to enable others to make films in countries where the in industry is relatively new, or to try to work with local crews. Whatever or however film is made, its power to project voice to multiple audiences, local, national, regional, and international, is unique and is a tool all working to deepen democracy and create a more sustainable world cannot afford to ignore. If in doubt, listen to what Liana Correa said at the, at, at the end of the Paris films. She said, we won't give up. It's worth fighting for a better future. The effects of climate change are global now, but we now have to globalize our solutions and ideas, no matter if we live in an undeveloped country such as Honduras or in Europe. We need to act now so that there will be a tomorrow. Thank you. So I think that point that uh, Janet's just made about the need to engage filmmakers, not just in the dissemination, but also in the research from the beginning is, is going to be crucial to our project in terms of the grant making element that we're going to have to be able to make grants to national scholars, which Emma will talk about a little bit after the break. Um, it's going to be crucial because that's what we want, is we want to be able to, to bring together the, the arts and the cultural um, communities with, with the research and to be able to tell both research and tell the stories differently. Um, and Naraja is co-investigator with, with myself on the project and, and with our other colleagues, Mandy and Christina, working with Emma. So we'll be taking that kind of message, message back. So, from a different perspective, the practitioner, you Greg. Stick, so no, you can sit, so you're allowed. Unlike my colleague, I haven't actually prepared a speech, I'm just going to ramble for about five or six minutes in the, in the hope that it makes sense. Um, thank you to... to uh, Undersell yourself before you yeah, get there. <laughs> yes, set the bar low. Um, you know, overperform. Um, thank you to, to Lisa and to Emma to, for inviting me to this. Um, I was saying to Emma earlier, this is, this is a, per a personal interest for me, partly because of my own personal trajectory. Uh, as Ruth mentioned, um, a long time ago now, uh, I was running the, the Parliament and Government Programme at the Hampshire Society and had spent four or five years up until about 2001 writing about how Parliament needed to be reformed. We reformed the Commons, we reformed the House of Lords and ran a commission at the Hansard Society um, chaired by Tony Newton and had the good and the great on it, including Zainab Badawi, who was lovely. Um, and uh, in 2001, to his surprise and everybody else's, Robin Cook became leader of the House of Commons and needed two special advisors who knew something about Parliament and were also active enough in the Labour Party to be cunning and political um, as an advisor. And, you know, this is a limited pool, so me and um, a, a professor <laughs> called uh, Meg Russell, who some of you may, may know, ended up working for him uh, up to the point he resigned over Iraq in 2003. And I continued. I worked uh, for Peter Haynes subsequently up until 2005 election, which is when I set up Global Partners Governance, which I'll come on to in a minute. But that transition from having written about reform of parliament um, and thinking that I really knew what I was talking about, you know, everything, it was so obvious what needed to change in parliament. It looks very different when you're inside government actually trying to implement these things. The transition from the quasi-academic world to the world of government was hugely complex. What looks very easy and obvious from the outside looks hugely more complex when you're on the inside of government. The big question often if you're trying to persuade, you know, Robin Cook to go into a cabinet meeting and persuade his colleagues that they should subject themselves to more scrutiny is, well, what's in this for the government? Um, and it's, it's a question that's often missed from the outside. Um, it was explained to me at the time when I first started working uh, as a special advisor by a senior clerk, not Liam, but somebody like Liam, um, who said to me, your job is to keep coming up with stupid ideas. My job is to explain to you why they are stupid. Um, and that was sort of the relationship between the special advisors and the clerks. Um, and it took me, I think, three years 
to win an argument with a clerk over a point of procedure. And when I did, I went out and got drunk because it was a, an amazing moment. Um, but there's a parallel that that transition, that personal transition that I went through from you know, thinking I knew what I was talking about um, to being in government and then realizing this is much more complex is similar to what's going on in the field we now work. Um, trying to support parliaments, political parties, ministries in you know, a number of different countries, all of which are facing huge problems. I mean, over the last 12 years, we've worked a lot in Iraq, uh, spent time in Libya, in Egypt, Jordan, Sudan, Tanzania, Rwanda, all sorts of different places. And if, if you are, is anybody here from Diffid, by the way? If you are, I'm, I'm going to be rude about Diffid in a minute, that's all, just to warn you. Um, if you go to meetings of donor agencies now, talking about the need to do, get institutions right, to reform government, there is that same sense of, we know that politics matters, we understand it, we get it. You know, actually, we really understand politics. Actually, they don't. They really, really don't. Um, at the launch of the World Development Report earlier this year, which is focused on politics and the importance of politics to getting development and to getting institutional change, somebody quizzed Rory Stewart, the minister for DFID, who was on the platform, and said, well, you know, so what? We, we get that politics matters, you know. Tell us something new. No shit, Sherlock. Um, and Rory Stewart, his reply was withering. And he said, look, the problem is, all these people saying, yes, we get politics, are exactly the people who know nothing about politics. He said, I, you know, I, I didn't know anything about politics until I became a member of parliament, about the complexity, about the difficulty of getting policy made, let alone then implementing this stuff and making sure it works. And that's the challenge in this field. Now, I think the virtue of this research network and the, the national researchers is that there is an innate understanding of some of those politics. My experience of trying to get reform through the Commons and the Lords emphasize the importance of the, the personal perspective on change. Lots of international support is framed around very good principles of greater democracy, representation, greater scrutiny, which are all you know, unarguable. However, MPs don't define themselves like that. They don't spend most of their time doing that. They, MPs are not elected because of what they do inside Parliament. They are elected because of what they do outside Parliament. It's the constituency stuff which actually determines whether they are re-elected or not, or their relationship with their party. And it was brought home to me in a conversation I had with a, a man called Salim Jaburi, who was chair of the Human Rights Committee in Iraq and is now speaker of the Iraqi parliament, which is the sort of arguably the second most important political position in Iraq. We worked with him for a long time with the Human Rights Committee to try and get things working more effectively and get the Human Rights Committee to achieve certain things. He was absolutely bought into everything that we were doing and you know, went away implementing this stuff. And it was only sort of 18 months, two years into working with him that he reflected to me in an idle conversation, well, of course, this is only 10% of my time. I'd assumed that this was import as important to him as it was to us. This was you know, one of the key parts of our project for him, it was 10% of his time. It was important to him, but it wasn't that important. You know, the, the other political stuff, the party stuff, that was the stuff which really absorbed him and was going to determine whether he had a successful political career or not. And that sort of stuff is, I think we're you know, pretty good at what we do and reasonably astute, but it's very easy to miss that sort of stuff. And it's, the, it's that understanding of the small P and the big P politics, which I think this network can fill a massive gap in the development field, informing the way that development is done. So it's more politically astute, more suitable to whatever environment, but also understands that stuff which is implicit, which is innate, which no matter how good international organizations are, they will never understand the complexity of politics at the local level. And that's why we need this network to exist. Um, uh, I'm sort of, as you probably saw, I'm now running out of things to say, but um, I, I think the... Um, I was going to finish, I was going to try and crowbar in a quote from Amartya Sen, because it's always good to end by quoting Amartya Sen. Um, but our approach to this sort of work and trying to understand it, the reason I set up GPG in the first place was because I was quite struck by how badly most of the international support work to politicians was done, because it seemed entirely apolitical. But it also seemed to be less about what 
the people in other countries needed than about what we had to give them. You know, and there were templates, there were institutional structures. You know, well, yeah, we understand your problem. What you need is this, and there was there is still a degree of of you know template fitting, the cookie cutter approach, as, as Tom Carruthers calls it. And I think one of the of Amartya Sen's quotes, which has always stuck with me, is that this sort of work is about enabling people to lead the sorts of lives which they think are worth leading. And that means if you are strengthening institutions, you are strengthening the institutions so that people can achieve what they want to achieve, not what you think they should be achieving. It's about the contestation of democracy. It's about if, you know, if you're setting up a democratic system, then you have to accept the result of those elections if it is democratic. And I think that's, again, one of the key things which this research network will help to fill. And I'll finish there. Sorry, open to the floor. I just want to ask, perhaps, we've got one question to you. I think it's perhaps draws some of this together, and I know it's something that you've you've um, thought about quite a lot uh, through through your work. But I'd be interested in Nurja's um, take on it. Um, this whole business of the, the balance between local and national commitments, and how members members of parliament prioritise their time, how they look at their role. Um, and particularly in the age as you were referring to, sort of, you know, now campaigns in terms of social media, you've got digital warriors, that MPs have got to respond so much to the, the new pressures that come through, the, through digital, and that you talked about earlier, Greg, in terms of, of what you were seeing among MPs in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, in terms, of, in terms of how MPs conduct their role, and we particularly see it in the comparison between Bangladesh and Ethiopia, where, the, where we're seeing through the research that MPs behave very differently in terms of that local um, national emphasis for their own particular political uh, environments. How we think about, get members to think differently about what representative democracy means for them. What kinds of, of incentives can, can we look to and levers can we look to to, um, to think differently about, about that? about the, the, the balance between the local and national and what they focus on and, and so on. I well, I mean, again, this is... Um, uh, w one of my areas of fascination over the last sort of 25, 30 years is the same as Emma's about what MPs do in constituencies. And too much of the international approach, the academic approach to politics says we shouldn't be doing this. You should be legislating. You should be overseeing. You should be scrutinising the budget. But as I say, that's not how MPs get elected. And I think the, the challenge in lots of the places in which we work is where you've got a new parliament, you often have a very high turnover of members at each election, you know, 60, 70, 80%. It's no good coming from the Westminster experience and trying to export what is happening here to those sorts of environments because a new MP here is absorbed into that culture quite quickly. You're socialised into certain ways of being, certain ways of behaving. Where you've got a new parliament, an absence of recent democratic culture, and you know, an 80% turnover, that's almost impossible. I mean, you think about any, any organization which employed 80% of its people on the same day, you'd struggle with that. But it's all the more problematic in parliaments because if you were in a school, for example, and you employed 80% of your teachers on the same day, you know that they would at least have similar backgrounds, similar training. They would have gone through a similar sort of process to get to the school to become a teacher. And th therefore, they would also have some common bonds of you know, commonality. In a parliament, it's the opposite. The, you know, what differentiates you from that, that other 80% in the parliament is probably stronger than what brings you together. So, so people come with hugely different expectations about what the institution is for, but also what their job is within the institution. What, what, should, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think part of the problem is that a lot of the very well-meaning international support to, say, induction programs for new MPs is that they focus on completely the wrong things. They tend to focus on you know, the rules of parliament, the theory of what a parliament should do. And it's like the analogy that I use. It's, it's, I will always revert to a football analogy if I possibly can. And it is like, you know, taking on a team of people to play football and spending a week teaching them about the rules but not letting them touch a football. You know, you, if you know how Parliament works, you know, that's useful, but it doesn't make you a good politician. It's not the same. It's, you know, you're learning the rules of the game, but you're not learning how to play the game. Now, 
very few induction programs actually give MPs the skills they need to be effective politicians, but they will teach them about the parliament. And I think that's, that's part of the problem. And I think this is, this is where some of the local dynamics that, the, you know, if you're an MP, the first thing you need to do is get re-elected. So you need to work out what do I need to do to get re-elected in a constituency system. You'll need to be aware of what voters are expecting you to do. You'll need to know what your party is expecting you to do. And I think that level of understanding is held at the local level in a way that international people coming in would never understand. Mitra, is there any sort of debate in India about the role of, of members, the kinds of discussions we've been having here no, today? There about isn't really a debate about that, but, but let me respond to the question that the Greg just did. Um, MPs are first and last soldiers of the party and uh, not servants of the people, right? Um, the whole process of getting what we call a ticket, to, I don't know what, whether you have a similar term, to contest elections uh, is a very, very fractious one. Um, money plays a very big role in it. So political financing is extremely important. You have to put in money to even literally buy the chance to contest from your political party. And if your political party doesn't give it to you, you go party shopping. So ideology counts for much less. And the, uh, and the desire to contest elections on a known party banner counts for more. Then you raise the money to contest the election, which is why our present parliament today is the most plutocratic parliament we've ever had from the time of independence. So uh, it has a large number of people who are wealthy, who have paid to first get the right to contest or to, or to, to get the ticket to contest and then to become candidates and then to actually get elected. So, the people, on the other hand, are uh, sort of more or less cannon fodder here. Uh, you work out the caste arithmetic, you work out the community arithmetic, and all of the other, all these other things, and uh, and you sort of get elected. But campaign financing, poll financing, is a very very big issue. On that, we have a debate, but that is one question on which all political parties across the board resist transparency. So. You know, with all the all the other reforms we've had in recent in the last couple of years, uh, campaign finance has not been touched, and that's the root of all the problems. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to throw it open to the floor for questions for our panelists coming at this debate about deepening democracy from very different directions, um, different experiences. So questions about their experiences, things they've said today, things Valerie Amos said today. Or things you'd just like to, to throw into the debate to, uh, to take it on further. Okay, any takers? Got a gentleman down here. We're Anybody doing better else? than Valerie already. Sorry? We're doing better than Valerie already. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? I can take in groups of two? No? Okay. You gentlemen. might not do so well. <laughs> you, you might regret this. <laughs> well, just, just thinking around the, just the, the, that last lot of discussion there. Um, and look and thinking in the context of democracy um, and how that translates on the basis that when a person works so hard, whether it's for financial reasons or whether it's for, for some ideology, once they get there, they have to let the people hear what they want to hear. And that these days has begun to translate itself into misinformation. And we only have to look in this country with Brexit and how misinformation around for or against ended up in, in a mess. We see in the, in the US how you feed certain things into the people um, and it now has the products of its own doing. Um, and there's so many dangerous things around to, to, for, for people because it's still having informed information to make a decision. Mm. All right, there is the internet, so you can search things, but there are certain parts of it that you don't know. Mm. Westminster is very much a closed shop so to be able to find everything. Um, how do we create a channel for the communities to be able to be more informed? Okay, great. Or maybe um, we are. And the next question is from Christina, just at the, the back there, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a question specific to Janet. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about this network is the fact that we, we come from different disciplines, you know, anthropology, political science, etc. But one of the things I've, I really like about it is the use of the arts in terms of promoting democracy and promoting this engagement between the parliament and people. And it's one of the things I 
really looking forward to see what sort of projects we get and what sort of ideas come. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more from your experience what works in terms of um, um, in terms of involving the people into projects, because I imagine it, it's not necessarily something that people get just like that. They might think it's completely different things. So in terms of reaction from the people, but also then on the other side in terms of you know the more sort of elite, let's say, such as like as MPs, ministers, you know, and what works, you know, what tips would you give in terms of if we advising artists and, and scholars working Okay, so we'll take those two first. So fake news, the influence of social media. Is social media expanding the opportunity for discourse on politics because it's drawing in new, different, younger groups, perhaps? Or is it actually causing us problems because it's, it's creating the ability, in effect, for, for um, lies, for things that are not true to, to you know, be disseminated at the speed of light? Greg, what's your thoughts? In terms oh, of I knew you were going to come to me on that. <laughs> um, in terms of, well, I was, I was looking at the ceiling, hoping that oh, it's not, not going to ask me that. Um, I mean, that's such a—it's a, it's a very important question. It's almost unanswerable. It's, I mean, I'm not sure. It's clearly played a big part in America, in in Europe over the last few years. It's. I'm not sure. I don't know enough about how that dynamic is playing itself in other countries. Um, I think the bigger, I mean, my, I guess my personal, and I speak solely as a, you know, just a personal reflection rather than one which I've researched, but I think my concern about the way in which social media is playing a part in political campaigns is that they, you know, they tend to be an echo chamber. You tend to, you know, if you're using Twitter or Facebook or whatever, you're tending to go to people who agree with you anyway and you're hearing your own views you know, reflected back to you more loudly. Um, you know, in the days where people used to buy newspapers, you, know, you, would, you could not avoid stuff which you weren't actually that interested in, but at least you knew it was going on. Um, social media, you're getting a channel of stuff which is you know, solely for you, and you're missing out all, the, all sorts of other stuff which is going on in the world, which, again, is probably just reinforcing your own view. The whole stuff about misinformation, yeah, it's, it's a massive, massive problem. Um, yeah, and I, I've got no answer to that at all. Um, I, I think, I mean, my assumption is that, you know, in politics, in history, you see the pendulum swing back and forth. And there's a certain point at which people will just get, you know, Twitter, it seems to me, has probably, famous last words, Twitter, Twitter seems to have gone over its peak because it's got so nasty, so acerbic, people will drift away from it and find something else. Um, as, a, as a route to finding out information. Um, and you have to hope that, that what we're seeing now, this populist drift over the last sort of few years, there will be a swing back at some point um, in the next decade as people you know, start to see through some of the people who they voted for in the last couple of years. Um, what I think we shouldn't lose sight of is what I was saying earlier about <coughs> the stuff you know, you see in certain African countries and how the prevalence of smartphones is opening up all sorts of new opportunities. And I mentioned that, you know, that every Tanzanian MP that we've met is on WhatsApp. They never, they never respond to email, as <laughs> my colleague will testify to. You try and email them and they just don't respond. WhatsApp, they get back to you quite quickly. And it's a way of them picking up on quite an honest discussion amongst groups of citizens in their you know, electoral area and understanding what is being said, you know, watching this you know, uh, firsthand but at a distance, but also being able to insert their voice into that conversation as and when they want to. Um, the question is whether then, if they're not, th th my, my concern is the, then the expectation of citizens as to what their MP should be doing in terms of that engagement in social media and whether that becomes another you know, uh, problem that MPs have to bear. No, yeah. So I think social, there is a central, uh, a, a central tension here. On the one hand, social media democratizes. It provides possibilities for average citizens to express themselves and to express their political views. So there is the democratizing side for which it was welcomed. You also have the other side, which is that you can, uh, that, that parties, at least in India, have social media cells which actually farm out. They contract the services of companies which uh, do the 
the tweeting and then the retweeting. And one journalist has actually recently written a book on this, uh, which shows, and, and there's an analysis being done of the countries from where these retweets are coming. So there's Thailand, there's Kazakhstan, there's a bunch of other countries, and all the retweets are coming from there. They're drafted centrally in, let's say, in New Delhi, and then the click activists, as they're called, who paid click activists, simply keep clicking and retweeting. It's the same message with the same grammatical errors very often. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and you know, sort of, there's, there's three or four messages put out on every subject. The, uh, so so that's, and now every party does the same thing. So MPs aren't actually tweeting themselves. Uh, it, is, it is a social media cell. And then this, these other sort of like advertising agencies, some kinds of agencies uh, who, run this, who run these campaigns. The net effect is echo chamber, yes, but it is polarizing. It is creating forms of political discourse which are polarizing. It's this extreme or that extreme, and there's nothing in the middle. So you will not, uh, in, you know, on, on political issues in India, if you scan Twitter, I do it fairly regularly, I scan it, and it's, you will not find mid, sort of middle of the road liberal positions being articulated. It's always extremes. And that is one problem with social media, I think. Janet, Christina asked for your views on tips for, for the project team and uh, members of the network about how we can best use, make use of the, the links with the arts. What, what works? What can we do? I think the, the most important thing is to start talking to people working in the arts and across different forms of culture right from the beginning. To not assume that your research may not be interesting from the beginning. Um, one of the most frustrating things when I was working full-time in, in development trying to communicate messages was that people would come to me and say, we can't tell you anything about this project till we've proven it's been a success. And you'd be saying, actually, the best story could be that it's not a success. And that's not to say that you shouldn't then get um, you know, further funding. It's to say that actually people like to know whether they're you know, the people who have had the project um, that develop with them or the people who've invested in it, what the lessons are right from the beginning. In terms, I mean, but, it's, but it is complicated, you know, you haven't got a lot of time, you might be trying to appeal to artists or producers who are also equally fraught for time. So I think you need to look at how you involve them quite carefully. Um, for me, what's really important is actually starting with the people you're researching and working with and asking them how they would like their story to be told. Do they want their story to be told? Do they want what you're finding you know, to, come, to come out? And I, I mean, I'm, I think that what's extraordinary is that most people do, and most people want their voice to come out there. And um, just trying to think about the subject um, in terms of the, the parliament side of it, what I think is quite interesting looking at what I've been doing is that often, Inadvertently, I've been helping create a space for people to talk to Parliament where they really thought they had absolutely no route to get to Parliament. And um, so I think, I think that's what could be very exciting for you in the network, is to identify issues that local people want to express that otherwise they just wouldn't have a chance to voice and then to work out how to do that. Back there. Hi, my question is for Professor Niraja. Um, thank you for your discussion. Sorry, uh, I can barely hear you. Yeah, speak up a little um. bit. Um, I, um, I was fascinated by what you said and the number of points you raised, um, in particular your point on who is the people, citizens need agency and that uh, democracy has been reduced to the election. Um, I agree with all your points on an ideological level, but I was wondering what you thought about the current state of um, democracy and its outreach within India. Um, in recent times, India has been hailed as a, an exemplary democracy in the South. Um, and um, there has often been criticism as to how far that can really extend to the billion plus people that live there and whether in fact um, 
democracy is really just being reduced to the votes for a number of them, or whether they do actually are actually able to enjoy the benefits of, of engaging in a democratic society. Um, so if you could shed some light on that, that would be appreciated. Yeah, well, that um, is that question. You would need a book to, to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, right, so my, my friend, the, the writer Ramachandra Guha, calls India a 50-50 democracy. Uh, so it's 50% not and 50% uh, democratic. Uh, but on a more serious note, um, uh, you know, if, if it was service delivery or success in poverty reduction that we were looking at as ways in which people um, you, you use the franchise to get to, to uh, improve their lives, uh, then clearly it is not a huge success, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't have such a large proportion of people below the poverty line. Um, on the other hand, we have had over, I mean, over the last uh, close to 70 years, we have had uh, some phenomenal examples of civic engagement of, uh, you know, in various forms, whether it's social movements or social audit experiments and, and so forth. So, so it's both sorts of things. You have had on the ground social movements which have been empowering. You do have in local governments, you've had almost a revolution. Uh, not realized fully and as it should be, but the, uh, but the sort of basis for it is present with, 50, with 50, for the most part, 50% uh, reservation for women, uh, which has in many parts of the country been extremely empowering. So, so there have been lots of positives, uh, but on the whole, I think the story still remains one of people being empowered only by the vote and the vote not going far enough. Um, if, you, um, if you are at all familiar with the um, uh, Maoist conflict in central India, uh, watch a film called Newton. It, it, it's just called Newton. Uh, it's about a man whose parents named him Newton. And he's an election officer and goes to this tribal area um, uh, to conduct an election. Just watch that film and then you get a sense of the, sort of the despondency, even about the act of voting. But on the other hand, the people of India have voted uh, to throw out a government that imposed a national emergency in 77. Um, so, but the vote, of course, varies. Uh, I, I, on the whole, I take your point that uh, elections and democracy is more about the vote than it is about any substantive outcomes. With the qualifier, as I said before, that there are and have been lots of examples. It's a very large country, but lots of areas where there have been um, examples of more um, of, of a more vigorous democracy being practiced. Okay, we have the lady here. Anybody else? We've got time for one or two more. No? Okay. Um, you can just wait for the sorry. mic. It would be difficult to pick up. Great. Um, it strikes me again, actually, as, as we were talking this morning as well, that it, it does seem to be also a, a problem of political parties, right? I mean... <laughs> You know, what is a political party for? Uh, if you, the, the Indian example, you know, Bangladesh, where you've got completely, you know, divided uh, parties that hold the whole, whole country to ransom, or, or Ethiopia, where it's basically a one-party state, and Burma, where they don't have really political parties yet. They have a government, but <laughs> no political parties. Um, you know, I, I, I just wonder if, if somehow this... Uh, Part of the crisis is, be, is a, an absence of uh, rigorous, ideological, visionary, polit you know, political parties that actually have policies to debate, um, and, and whether um, whether in in part of this uh, part of this local research, indigenous research, can be around you know what. You know what kind of uh, why do people go into politics? Why do they become MPs? And what is it that out, because as you say, it's not really the work they do in terms of legislation, legislation and stuff in the and that's not why they become MPs. So what is it? Why do they decide to become MPs? And I would imagine that a lot of them are driven by a, a desire for a better life for themselves and their families and hopefully beyond that <laughs> for their country. Um, I, I just wonder if, 
I mean, each of you with your, with your you know, experiences in different countries and, and, and working in government, I mean, what is it that, why, why do people seem to change once they get into power? <laughs> Oh, yeah, you've got to go first. Um, <laughs> I was hoping for a, a few more minutes to think about that one. Um, I, I, Jeanette, I, th I mean, I think these are, yeah, critical issues. Um, I think there's, in terms of, you know, what are, what are parties for? Um, you know, the political parties that we have in, in Western Europe, in America, are a reflection of the cleavages in society at the end of the 19th century. And there was a clear, you know, Acknowledgement at that time that if you wanted, yeah. you know, to change your own uh, material circumstances, the best way to do it was to form a political party, a trade union movement, and try and, you know, get control of the levers of power. Um, that's not the same anymore. It's not quite clear what problem parties are the solution to. Yes. And I think, whereas they were, they they had been. The the problem is. What if you don't have parties? You need some way of aggregating public opinion. If you, if you believe in representative democracy, and I firmly do, then you need something to aggregate popular opinion. The problem is that in lots of places where, you know, again, well-meaning efforts at you know, political support have been directed towards strengthening political parties, it's completely the wrong thing to do because in countries where there is deep division, you know, parties form around different, you know, uh, parts of identity. Whereas in, in Europe it was around class interest. If you go to many countries, then those main points of identity, those main points of division are around ethnicity or tribe or sect or religion. And the parties actually serve to emphasize those sorts of divisions in places where they should be, you know, the point of the parliament should be to alleviate them. The alternative, you know, the, the other main type of party that's causing a problem is one which is dominant and in order to get on, you need to be a member of the political party. It's a source of patronage and corruption. And you can see this in a number of, you know, the countries that I know in Africa, a number of parties which conform to that, that sort of model. Um, Francis Fukuyama's book on political order and political decay, The Oranges of Political Order, really interesting on this, in that he points out that, um, you know, if the economy, if you cannot rely on economic development, if the economy is tanking, you know, if there are your economic prospects of the economy, if there aren't opportunities there for entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs go into politics. Mm -hmm. And that, because that's a way of them serving their own best interest. There is scope to get access to resources, to patronage, to improve your own um, uh, political, personal, economic circumstances in a way that not available in, in the private sector because the private sector isn't strong enough. There's something in that. What? I'm not entirely sure, but yeah. Yeah, so, um, I mean, one of the problems with our political parties is not simply, um, uh, you know, not having debates about policy, uh, which they are short on, but broadly speaking, you know what sort of ideological frame uh, uh, they, they have adopted and follow. Uh, however, the traffic that, that occurs in the real world between one party and another, when you see people who have worked for years in one party then switch to another, suggests that that ideological hold is actually not so strong. But one of the problems that has dogged all political parties uh, in India is the lack of democracy within parties. We don't have the sorts of structures that, uh, that I think exist, for instance, in this country. Uh, so, uh, so uh, yeah, the lack of inner party democracy uh, sounds like a very Soviet word, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> uh, the lack of inner party democracy is a serious problem. Ideology is less of a problem, um, but, uh, but there is a certain flexibility about ideology simply because uh, at some level, particularly at the present moment, parties are constantly searching for a message that they can put out that does not sound stale and old and can manage to get popular support in uh, in the election. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I mean, there's one other point I had in mind, um, but I forgot, maybe I'll come back to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got two sort of reflections. One is that from the work I've done really with 
from the grassroots level, and particularly looking at the Equator Initiative Award winners for the Paris Climate Change Conference, what struck me was that out of 21 different um, initiatives driven by local people, they were all, I mean, I'd, I'd say at least a third of them had managed to challenge laws that shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't have been able to break through. So somehow they were... Um, having an impact at a local level in terms of changing um, uh, legal, legal structures and then at an international level as well. And so I don't know the scope of all of your research, but I think what's really interesting is looking at, at how those kind of grassroots initiatives can facilitate change, which is somehow going through... The, the parties. I mean, they, were, they all clearly spoke about how they would, uh, you know, look at the different stakeholders and target audiences and work a way through that and not, and not be put off. And it's, I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, the other reflection I've got is that I'm from the John Smith Trust in terms of um, why people go into politics. Um, we used to have leaders from the Soviet Union and the Middle East coming to this country to st study democracy. I have to say I'm quite glad I'm not running that organisation anymore because I'm not quite sure what I would say a lot of the time. But um, I think that one has to assume that most people going into politics, well, certainly those people I met, um, tend to come from a position where they have a belief that they want to change something for the better. Mm, yeah, you, you have to start from that. And then what happens? I don't know. I think, I think most people... Well, quite a lot of people do, do stick to why they've gone into politics. Um, <laughs> but often that isn't a story that's told. So actually, in terms of the research, what might be interesting is actually to find examples of politicians who have stuck to where they've come from, rather than look for the, the people who have kind of not. Because I think that actually, if you talk to a lot of MPs, they are still re-elected and elected and elected because of they understand their local constituency and they respond to their local constituency. No, Jane, you can... Oh, right, uh, the question, no, I, I remember what it was that I needed to respond to, which was, why do people enter politics? So I think there are a very large number of people uh, in India who would genuinely want to be in politics for the best reasons of public service. But those people generally find it hard to get an entry into political parties mm -hmm. because they can't afford to pay their way and the plutocrats tend to control parties. A party, again, it comes back to party finance and the extent to which big capital is, um, is uh, enmeshed with this process. And that's the mm -hmm. least transparent uh, part of it. So, so it, it, it is a case of self-interest and what economists call rent-seeking and the possibilities of rent-seeking, uh, but that's the monopoly, uh, that, that, that's the attribute of those people who exercise a monopoly over political parties and over their finances. Uh, right. but, whereas there are lots of people, and I mean, the, the current chief minister of Delhi who started the party, whose name translates as Common Man's Party, uh, uh, was a former tax official who then start, you know, went into this anti-corruption movement thing, um, he's, he's presently the chief minister, and he, you know, he is truly animated by, I mean, uh, there are lots of other problems with his way of doing politics, uh, serious problems, but, uh, but he is genuinely, he's a, he's a sort of populist at, at one level, but he is genuinely animated by the ideal of public service. And there are lots of people mm -hmm. like that, but the entry barriers are, are very, very formidable. Yeah. Okay, I can see other hands. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, so uh, if we're going to get to the next, the final session in. But, but that final session is, is dedicated to sort of discuss, further discussion and debate. So if you haven't got your question, you'll be able to ask it then. Um, also, you can speak to our panellists over the, over the coffee break. One of the things I think we, are, as a project, are going to have to grapple with is this whole concept, looking forward, of what is success going to look like for our project. Um, and uh, we've had a very broad-ranging, really interesting discussion coming at the issue of, of democracy and how we might deepen it, how we might reform it, um, coming at it from very different perspectives that will help inform our thinking. Um, but just in terms of what success might look like, I mean, changing the concept of democracy, changing the concept of what the people are, um, what's the point of political parties, why are people going into politics? So just a few things for us to, uh, to grapple with. Um, and uh, kinds of issues we, we've 
um, come across th this panel, party shopping, digital warriors, and I think, uh, I think Newton, the election official, is going to have quite a few hits on YouTube tonight, because I've seen everybody, <laughs> everybody looking at it. So, uh, right, can I ask you to thank our panellists very much for a really interesting discussion, and uh, then um, after that, tea and coffee break, 15 minutes. By that clock up there, we can be back in our seats for five past four. Ladies and gentlemen, if you mind joining me too, thank our panellists. Thank you. Thank you.